three comments on uh, Joost's uh, interesting suggestions and also Raymond, which I think are legal, but uh, very dangerous. It's true that a standard is not defined in TBT, and two, three, five governments can get together and form a standard, and if a national measure complies with that standard, it's presumed to be WTO consistent. And it's also true that you can have things like ACTA, you can have OECD standards, all these things outside that have an impact. But I think that what we have to think about also is the consequence. If each time, for instance, the EC says we're 27, we have a standard, so all we do are is consistent, the risk about that. And this is my uh, other point about the boomerang effect. Um, more than talks are needed, more than information is needed, negotiations on trade and climate change are needed. And if we go back to the ma main case law we have on shrimp, when Malaysia was told you cannot block the US because they've tried and tried to negotiate and you refuse, we should think that each time a country says, no, I don't want to talk trade in UNFCCC or I don't want to talk cl climate change here, it's almost a chip saying to the other side, you can go unilateral. Because at some point, they'll go unilateral if there's no place to negotiate. And my last point, which is a bit together, the boomerang effect. <clears throat> I'm a, I use the example, can the EC just say we're 27, we have a standard, that's it, we're WTO consistent. The world has changed. A border tax adjustment can also be an export restriction from China or from another one. And it's not the US EC who invoke 20 now, it's Brazil entire, it's China and export restriction. So what should come out, and I was surprised that it didn't come out uh, from the panelists, is this point. When governments go unilateral, maybe it's the only way because they cannot negotiate anywhere, we should all think of what's going to happen if everybody goes unilateral or if another big player goes unilateral on the other side. An export restriction is the equivalent to a border tax adjustment or border regulation, and 20 can be invoked on both sides. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Tom Brewer. I'm a <coughs> excuse me, Schuller uh, Foundation Research Fellow in uh, Germany. Um, <coughs> the presentations were quite uh, informative and provocative. Uh, let me suggest that there's a whole range of possibilities that didn't get touched on. Uh, Almost inevitably, there is, of course, a special uh, concern here in this city, in this institution, with multilateral solutions. And so the focus almost inevitably is on relations between the WTO and the FCCC. Uh, it's, it seems to me that what the world is likely to end up with, and I will have a question momentarily, uh, what the world is likely to end up with is a highly pluralistic, not terribly environmentally effective, not terribly uh, economically efficient, but politically feasible array of agreements with very little coherence, lots of contradictions, very little coordination. And part of that will be a whole series of, of agreements coming from the MEF, coming from the G20, uh, from World Bank activities, from UNCTAD, from ICAO, from IMO, uh, and I could go on, and OECD, of course, and, and a whole lot of other um, regional and bilateral agreements. So uh, my question is, wouldn't it be helpful if we expanded the agenda to uh, put more thought into pardon me, but non-WTO and non-FCCC uh, issues. And I know you were all sort of heading in that direction, but I think that it should be somehow ex an explicit part of the, of the analytic agenda and eventually the policy-making agenda. Uh, that, that was a question. Take maybe one, one more and then we'll ask the panelists to respond. After listening to uh, the entire debate, one gets the impression that, you know, uh, that uh, one, uh, it is, there, there seems to be a sense of panic 
you know, that, you know, that if nothing is happening at the even FCC, so something should be done. One well, gets that impression. You know, people are talking about border attack adjustments, all these things. Uh, my personal view is that, you know, uh, I listened to Ambassador uh, Fuxeng, one point he made, that if when you are prescribing a medicine, you should also consider the side effects. So I found that, you know, the side effects would be more than what medicine we are thinking. I have three, three points to make, uh, Mr. Yeah, but yeah, but two basic facts, and uh, third point I will make about what should be the recommendation. We have talked about international trade, but we must find out in the basic thing is, is first of all, we are talking about trade and climate change. But the question arises is, is trade, international trade is the cause of global warming? That is the first question we should answer. The carbon dioxide emissions, it, there are published literature which said it is 14 grams per, uh, per ton, um, per, uh, 14 grams of carbon dioxide emission per ton per, per kilometers. And it is not much. And total emissions from the maritime shipping is only 3% of the total global emissions. And 80% of the transport, uh, internationally traded goods are transported by sea. So this is a basic fact. Second, uh, the point which was highlighted by Madame Vesili, what WTO is doing, that we didn't emphasize. Because WTO already allows members to adopt environmental policies, but subject to meeting certain requirements. Article um, 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 20 um, B, Article 20 G already allows. And you have a similar requirement in agreement on services. Article 27 of TRIPS agreement allows members to adopt a, um, the environmental measures. Similarly, you have uh, this um, TPT agreement uh, recognizes environmental protection, uh, protection as one of the fundamental objectives and allows members to take measures in, in, in pursuance of that. <coughs> Similarly, you have SPS agreement. So WTO already allows you to take environmental policies, provided you do in a non-protectionist manner. So that is the, and WTO, uh, and uh, Madam Vesely has highlighted what are the work that WTO is already doing, I don't have to elaborate. Now the question is that when we are talking about border measures. What is the ground of taking border measures? Because you want there should be a level playing field between the domestic player and the foreign player and the domestic player. That is the argument. But here there is a serious flawed logic here. Because when you talk about that, you are basically undermining the principle of CBDR. And if you have to respect CBDR, then you cannot expect all trading partners to adopt emission control measures of equal intensity. I will give you certain facts. I will give you certain facts because climate change, as you know, it is a global problem. So naturally it requires a global solution. And all of us, we know climate is changing not because of your current emissions, but because of accumulated emissions which are already in the atmosphere. And, it, um, and if you cut atmosphere and you can, there are published record, you can find out, you can find out which country has pumped how much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. That is a fact. But that is why UNFCC envisages deep and significant cuts in emissions of industrialized countries. But you will always tell me, look, this is all past history. Because the growth in emissions comes from developing countries. Accepted. That is fair. This is because from a stock perspective, developed countries. From growth perspective, developing countries. That is a fact. That is why it is it, the principle has been agreed that we have to the cost of reducing emissions have to be borne by in accordance with common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities and on the basis of equity. This was the principle which was agreed in uh, 1992 reiterated in Copenhagen Accord and again in Cancun Agreements. Now, people have here, commentators have expressed uh, pessimism, uh, pessimism. I do not know why, why we are uh, uh, pessimistic about this thing. Because we know that everybody has predicted failure at Copenhagen. But we had, people say that it is a broken Hagen. But you had Copenhagen Accord and it laid a foundation for future action. Now, more than 100 countries have subscribed, uh, giving uh, their commitment under this accord. Now, uh, um, 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 and accounting for 90% of the emissions. But it is a difficult problem if you cannot do it now in the um, Durban, but the answer lies in having a global treaty. 
global trip because when the countries are we are working towards a global treaty then if you are talking about utms then it is a distraction because because it is a distraction so i would suggest i think none of us believes that the wto is the only forum in which trade is discussed and that unfccc is the only place where you can expect any progress on climate change i, th I think that uh, uh, the, what was implied in Ricardo's example of the, of, the, of the energy trade agreement is that we have to start getting a lot more inventive. And um, I think there's a principle, and there's a principle that, that uh, in my institute we discussed quite a bit after, after Copenhagen, which is if you are determined to make progress uh, on climate change, uh, to get action taken that will limit the buildup of carbon in the atmosphere, Surely the best thing to do is to look right across the horizon at where interesting initiatives are taking place that could be replicated or scaled up, where political agreement might be close and a little effort there might move things forward. In other words, to, to look at the entire landscape and look at where an investment is likely to yield the greatest result. And I think we need to learn to do that. I, I know that um, a number of people in, in, in the US, where I was born, um, so sort of gave up on the government long ago and said, the U.S. can make pro progress on climate change, but it'll be made at the level of states or municipalities or corporations, that we need to federate those, we need to bring them together, we need to build on those. And I think that's a, a very important lesson. We tend to say that, well, since WTO is the lead organization on trade, if there's no progress there, there's no progress. And I don't think that uh, anybody, anybody really believes that anymore. And I think that this... This, this search for unconventional solutions should be one that, does, that is not too bounded by, by the limits of, of tradition, by the way things have been done in the past. I think implicit in some of the things Raymond had in his slides is, is that uh, some of these things that we thought of as taboo, like, like uh, accepted green criteria for, for discrimination, uh, it's not obvious that it's the right solution, but certainly we ought to be talking about it. Because if we feel we need to get across that bridge to a green economy or green forms of growth or whatever you want to call it, we need to figure out what is most likely to take us across that bridge. And if it involves calling into question uh, some of the things that, are, that, are, that, are, that, are, uh, that were considered rigid uh, in the past, well, let's call them into question again. The, the world requires it. It's not that we don't have any tools at present. We do, and a lot of them have been laid out on this table. But what we've seen is that by applying those tools, we can make progress, but the progress is at much too slow a pace. And if we project that forward, we're going to lose the battle. So uh, we, can, we can either see whether other things will, can work and use the full range of, 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 of uh, tools out there, of forums out there, or create new ones, such as ICTSD is doing, or we can sit back and say, gee, it's pretty frustrating. We don't make much progress here. We don't make much progress over there. Negotiators, politicians, they should no longer blame or they should stop blaming their inaction to formal WTO rules of consensus, MFN, what have you. And I'm not saying we should forget about state consent. So, Patrick, I'm not saying we should uh, drop the consensus or consent idea. Oh, the opposite, actually. I, I think we should reinvigorate the idea that States can get together and in a bilateral or in a plurilateral agree on something and no longer feel hostage to that WTO consensus idea. So we, we can't really give up the good because there's theoretically something better out there. Now what, what Gabriel was referring to is, is the, the crux then. You know, if we have say a bilateral or plurilateral, what does that mean for WTO members who didn't sign up to this? Will you have this kind of a, a boomerang? Now there, I, if, if I'm reading the, the Stuna report correctly, it would, not be, it would not be possible for the EU 27 to get together and enact a standard. And I fully agree that shouldn't be possible. That's <coughs> what I really was trying to refer to, this idea of a thick consensus. You don't need explicit state consent, what you need is a thick consensus. And, and it's defined as a general agreement characterized by the absence of sustained opposition to substantial issues by any important part of the concerned interest. So it's much more subtle than a, a basic um, state consent requirement, which in my view opens the door to 
to evaluate. The other gentleman was referring to, you know, we'll have a regime <coughs> complex. I, I think all of these efforts out there will be looked at, should be looked at, but weighed differently. Not because the state consented or didn't consent, but by looking at who, who issued the rule, what kind of an authority is it, what were the procedural uh, elements that were respected, and substantively how much weight uh, should we give it. And then to the Indian, uh, the delegate from India, exactly right. The, the point is, what is the counterfactual? If you don't let it happen through bilateral plurilaterals, okay, we could have it at the WTO with everyone agreeing, but it won't happen. What is the alternative? Unilateral. Okay, the alternative is unilateral, and many people are saying we can do a lot of stuff unilaterally, so I would imagine to do it bilaterally, plurilaterally, is even better. Or what is the other alternative? If we don't do anything, the appellate body will do it. And as I said, for me, I feel more comfortable if, if a group of elected people, experts, sit together and decide on how to do this than three judges. If uh, these multilateral all-encompassing <coughs> solutions are first best, and then these plurilaterals may be second best, <coughs> and, uh, there may be other types of third best, including how do we reign over uh, those actors that Thomas is, is uh, talking about. So when the, uh, subnational entities and corporations and non-governmental entities start uh, then generating schemes to address climate change and those have trade effects, um, that may be, again, third or fourth best. Um, down at the bottom of that list is unilateral action. I, I, I tend to think that that's the one that we need to uh, contain. And I think that what we're saying is, uh, and, I, and I hear Gabriel's point, that uh, when, when the, a party refuses to negotiate, it's an invitation for unilateral action. But this is where I think, again, we need to, to, be, um, <coughs> to be more creative, as Mark says. Uh, we, can, uh, we can go very general about trying to resolve these issues. So again, uh, Joss has gone through, through a review of what's possible. We can further bring the GATT uh, through an interpretation of current rules under Article 9.2 um, of the WTO agreement, uh, go through plurilaterals under Article 2.3, Article 99, uh, the, the Annex 4 or 5 type of solution that just uh, talked about, the waivers under Article 9.3, the peace clauses that have been have been uh, suggested by some for the by, by, for the um, uh, BCAs or even the moratoriums uh, as uh, as possible sort of temporary solutions, uh, or we can try to find again these coalitions of willing and form then dynamics that would generate the type of agreements that we need. And, and the, the question of unilateral action is such that, that well, it's, it's something that, that uh, the system will have to confront very soon. And, and it's not likely to be a nice confrontation. So we have uh, the feeding tariffs case here, which hasn't ruled yet, but uh, which uh, from the analysis that we have uh, uh, made uh, will very likely make very many people unhappy. Um, the conversations that we've had with delegations, with people that are uh, that have interest in the industry, on, the, on energy and so on, are fascinating when it comes to this case. Um, because they're full of, again, of contradictions from governments that you couldn't imagine. You're getting signals that they would like to review then the rules of local content here in the WTO, <coughs> or on, on discrimination. And then, uh, uh, so, so again, you start seeing the geometric configurations of interest that are very different when you put the case, the specific cases on the table. Um, whatever comes out in that ruling is going to affect investment and, uh, uh, and again, progress on clean energy technologies in a major form. Uh, already some of the, even the European governments are adopting the schemes that, again, would, would be covered by this kind of, uh, of discussion solution. The, the proposed uh, um, incorporation of aviation in the in European ETS uh, is another case in point. Uh, so I, I probably don't have to tell you much about it as it's being played right now. But uh, the legality with WTO, notwithstanding that the European Court of Justice may have ruled that, it, that in other international law, the measures are consistent, is um, it's, it's very questionable and, uh, and then the question that, that any action from this House against that kind of 
measured is going to necessarily bring forward is whether countries in the WTO favor or not the action on climate. And that is the big difficult question that will need to be uh, responded. Uh, and, uh, and again, what we're saying is, I think, and I hear some, some of my colleagues in the panel saying something similar, is it's much better to sit down and negotiate uh, and try to find creative ways and have the conversation. And it's taken too long to have that conversation. We started talking about climate change 20 years ago. We, we started talking about climate change specifically to the WTO here in the WTO in this same room. I made a, I, I came up with a taxonomy of the, of the connection and so on in 2006 and 2007 and, and, and so on. And uh, so we need uh, for governments to take up the decision to start discussing these things in, with the mind to move forward on the specifics. I think climate change and the WTO are stuck for one reason, that the rules that you make there have a binding effect on governments. And governments at a national level need to stay in power, get re-elected. And the two are contradictory um, a lot of the time. I think Tom and uh, Gabrielle put their fingers together on the same topic, two sides of a coin. Uh, do we go for fragmentation of the multilateral trading system, the global consensus on climate change, or do we go for a grand bargain by upping the stakes in the name of global good, common humanity? I think most of us will fall on the, sec on the second option. Uh, broken as it may, difficult as it may, we haven't given up, and I don't think we will, for the simple reason because the first option takes us down a very, very slippery slope, which Ricardo was talking about, and the ultimate unilateral action multiplied by 193, that's the, that's the bigger universe, we are only 153, is something we cannot fathom. So there's a value, there, there's also something missing in this conversation, which is I think all of us sit here are very, who are sitting here are very fortunate to be able to partake in this conversation from a point of view of people who, people, societies, organizations who have the capacity to engage. There are member states, there are parties to the convention who do not yet even at the governmental level have the capacity to engage the way we are sitting here talking today. Now, they are the price takers. Um, the other extreme of the, the, the spectrum for unilateralism is that the biggest boys will set the price. Now, I can't stand for that, and we're not badly off. There is something to be said for a rules-based system, which is what we, at the end of the day, are trying to promote. And that is something we cannot afford to abandon because there may be rules that have to be a little bit more flexible, there may be rules that have to factor in reality, but there must be rules. Um, that's not the answer to everything that's been raised here, and all of it is pertinent. But I think this gives you the idea of the complexity that we're dealing with. Uh, uh, and, and I think to address the plurilateral um, 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 uh, issue that yours has raised, it's something that's floating out there. Because there's this high level of frustration with the inability or the, the slow pace at which the multilateral is moving. But this has to be a very careful exercise at the end of the day because it must complement, supplement, and underscore the multilateral, even if you engage in that flexibility of moving with a coalition of women. If you go the other way, and I will tell you, even in bright sunlight, it's very difficult to tell what the motivations are of the parties who engage in this. If you go the other way, you could end up on a very, very slippery slope with no traction. So these are the, are the realities that I think at the end of the day bring governments back to this slow as it is um, um, favor of, favoring of the multilateral process because the rules matter. Thank you. Did you
discussion today proved uh, my view that we are all in the realm of speculation, views, and opinion. There are sometimes good analysis that we also had today from Peter Wooders and Scott Barrett, Rubinis, and others. But still, these are all, uh, we do not have the facts. Our members here and the, the UNHCC delegates do not have the facts in front of them because they don't seem to want the facts. This is what uh, the impression one gets, one, one hears to, uh, to the negotiators. Uh, here in WTO, we had this, it was already mentioned, uh, 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 monitoring of protectionist measures pursuant to the financial crisis, but we don't have an uh, evaluation of uh, monitoring of uh, protectionist measures pursuant to the climate crisis. I mean, this, we could put these crises on, on uh, similar levels and see what are the trade effects. The second point I want to make, I simply do not understand this um, plurilateral proposal, standards proposal, and um, peace clause. Fine, if they are a solution, fine. But who is going to do them? If we could not get the, our parties here, and when you keep on saying 153 and 153, the negotiations are done by, by some parties at the first level, uh, when we cannot get those parties, when in the climate change area, if we can't get uh, developed countries, emerging economies, uh, putting their heads together and deciding what to do, who is going to be party to that plurilateral agreement if the, the main economies are not parties to that agreement? Uh, to, if they can't do it in WTO in the multilateral context, how are they going to go into another room and say, let's have a standards, let's have a plurilateral agreement? Second thing, I don't understand your standard, really. Is this a process standard? Is this a product standard? I mean, you, you <coughs> alluded to the tuna, um, Atlantic tuna standard, but that, that's a specific standard. It's not in this whole climate change area where you can have a, a trade standard. Uh, it's, it's, there are some issues that are ambiguous and they need uh, uh, further discussion, I believe. Uh, a fact that all of, all of us have been following, that is the increasing signing of FTAs and RTAs and BITs, where environment is increasingly part of it. So our government seemed to be able to do this on a bilateral or in a regional uh, level, but not here. And they're not able to do something at UNFCCC for all the reasons that I think we all have followed. But I, I just observe that we have reached an impasse. So it's a bit surrealistic to talk about the fine points of how we could maybe chisel around stuff that we already have. I would agree with Mark, we have to step out, in that sense my, my uh, title, we have to step out of the box of the, and that's not, not, not to say that what we have is wrong, but we need something in addition, above, not, what, not to think that we just go on and on and on and spend more years to come. I'm, by age, I'm, I won't have to probably suffer the consequences fully of, of climate change. I think it's a, irresponsible not to think out of the box. And uh, Gabriel's suggestion or observation, uh, I agree, there's the boomerang effect. Um, and <clears throat> just to add the uh, plurilateral part, nobody has mentioned one plurilateral agreement within this house, which is doing quite well. It's public procurement. It's government-related activities. It's doing so well that even I hear China and India is in, are interested in joining. So why not, why disregard something which exists, which is doing very well, a plurilateral agreement, why don't we do one that is pertaining to climate change and trade? I don't see why this should not be possible. I have to say that, that um, different words are used for similar things, but the same measure, or measure is not used for the climate context as for the trade. For example, we hear a lot of bad things about unilateral action in the climate context, but it's, it's praised in the context of the trade, uh, in, uh, of, of trade activities. It's called policy space. But I would say to you that one, one person's unilateral action is another policy space. We have the same, uh, in, same kind of issue where 
um, there's a, there's a, a properly, I think, a, a support for something called a rules-based system. Uh, now, that's a, that, that would be a good idea in the climate area, but most of the discussion today about the rules-based system in the WTO was actually trying to undermine some of the aspects of the rules-based system. Uh, I'm not saying generally, but uh, we heard something about local content requirements uh, sort of being something good. I, I have a really hard time seeing that because, uh, I, I mean, this, this is sort of a, a basic uh, non-discrimination issue that's n not even recent. I mean, it, it's really a, a fundamental principle of the GATT, of, of, the non of discrimination, that's 100 years old, even before the GATT, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of, of trade treaties. And, and we, what we haven't heard today either is the success of the multilateral trading system. Now, I, I know we don't talk about that a lot these days with what's going on in Doha, but, you know, it's, uh, it, it was only in what, I, I think Patrick would know if, what year precisely, but not so long ago that we finally reached international trade and prosperity levels of the pre-1914 le uh, of, of 1914 levels. So um, I, I think that we have to, as, as, as my Indian colleagues say, not panic uh, and not draw all sorts of conclusions without and, and come away from this with some idea that one thing is bad and another thing is good when if, if you turn it around, uh, it, it actually could be seen uh, uh, in, in a different light. I mean, I think that the lesson that we have in the, in the trading system is that some of the general principles we have actually need to be looked at further on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, and, and, and it's worked pretty well um, under those circumstances, keeping in mind the fundamentals of non-discrimination. Thank you. To my observations, I see that there are two extreme sides. One see that we need hard and comprehensive additional legal measures on the other hand, the emphasis is made on soft measures. Uh, however, I think maybe the real emphasis should be that the, 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 there should be a two-step procedure. All these soft measures are a step towards these kind of uh, legal and comprehensive measures. So to that end, for example, at the moment, we need to decide where the private uh, action and public action starts. Maybe. Uh, I mean, there are some cases, perhaps ample cases, where private initiatives are way beyond uh, governments or any uh, hybrid formations. So I think uh, the key issue should be uh, to what extent we should monitor and perhaps uh, control these private initiatives uh, uh, which are likely to emerge or which have already emerged. I wonder uh, whether you have any uh, like plans or any projections whether I mean to control these private formations or to just leave them on their own dynamics uh, I just wonder w uh, the your you know uh, uh, perspective on this issue thank you over there thank you uh, just a short comment um, vice you from the South Center um, I, I think the the, the point that Gabriel raised about you know, negotiations or not negotiating and then coming up with unilateral measures is, is well taken. And I think in the climate context, what we have there is a situation where a group of developing countries composed of Africa, the African group, Brazil, China, India, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, um, I think Uruguay as well, and uh, Lebanon have actually gotten together and said, we prefer the multilateral route. And that is why we want to see, uh, you know, the, these countries, that is why they're saying essentially in their text, as I understood it, uh, that um, the that, uh, multilateral route is preferred and that the uh, venue for discussing this trade and climate linkage, as far as unilateral trade measures are concerned, is in the climate convention because that is where you would be able to see a holistic and integrated treatment of the issue in relation to uh, to what our Indian colleague was mentioning, um, the issue of, of uh, non-discrimination in, in the context of the principles of the convention, which would mean that you have to reflect equity and common but differentiated responsibility and respective cap capabilities. So the issue here is, one, um, there are already attempts to start up multilateral negotiations and this. Unfortunately, there are also others which do not perhaps, you know, for, for reasons of their own, do not see that particular venue as the venue. Now, should that be the WTO? That's something that, I guess, 
<coughs> those of you who are negotiating in this building will have to answer. But uh, the, the, the point I want to raise is um, when you uh, talk about unilateral measures, I think there's a clear preference from a large number of developing countries um, that have clearly indicated that they would, they would prefer the multilateral route. Uh, they do not see unilateral trade measures on the grounds of climate change as, uh, as an effective way of addressing uh, the climate change problem and that these measures should be part of a holistic uh, policy regime um, uh, in order to be able to address not only the environmental aspects of climate change but also the economic aspects of it. Thank you. Does anyone on the panel really believe that with vested interests a full multilateral uh, agreement could ensure that global emissions peak within 10 years? Uh, if they do, I, I'd be, I, I'm amazed, uh, but I would really, really like to know if anyone actually thinks that's really a reality. I don't think the fact that it doesn't work here means it won't work anywhere. I, I, that, that I doubt. And secondly, on the, the reference to standards, that's a, that, that's a very valid point. So, obviously the TBT would only cover standards that deal with a, a product or a production uh, process. So it wouldn't cover certain things we, we may want to deal with. Um, my point was rather that the way standards have been defined in that separate universe of the standardizing uh, world, I, I think is, is very instructive and could be used for all kinds of other initiatives we have, even though technically they are not standards, but this idea of seeking a thick consensus, looking at authority, looking at procedure, at substantive elements, to me that's the way to go, to weigh different initiatives you may have and, and give some weight to one, but perhaps not to another. So to, to apply this thinking beyond standards as such, Vesela needs to say something. Yes, this plurilateral business. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, not, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not enough that the like-minded get together and have a plurilateral agreement. You have to have the United States in there, you have to have China in there. It's not enough that Singapore and European Union goes next door, go next door and have a plurilateral agreement. Because climate change is a global problem. You have to get the main emitters in there. That's what I want to say. Anyone else? <coughs> okay, Mark. Can I respond to what my okay. neighbor okay. just said? I think I, I, I beg to disagree with you. We don't need for the big elephants to join. Uh, we just remember UNFCCC and the Clean Development Mechanism. The US insisted on it. It's not even a signature to the UNFCCC. So why not start with countries who are committed, who want to make a difference, and then I think the big ones will come and join. Thanks, Patrick. Just to, to respond to the point that I think Vice <coughs> made, I think it's a very valid point that you say this group of developing countries had um, the proposal is about embracing the multilateral. And I fully agree with that. But I think what we have, um, what this is still uh, uh, an ongoing discussion, what we don't find helpful is <coughs> the positing of a north south uh, divide in that proposal. Because if we've just heard this, that, that's not an issue. And I don't think that's issue come up, uh, that, 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 that's something defining of what we've heard today. This affects everybody, and I think that's where the solution has to be global, but they, I think it's where the ideology, the ideology doesn't help. I think if you are to be meaningful, we've got to start looking at in meaningful ways, and that, that's, that's the only point I have. Thank you. Mark, that, that, what, that clock's a little fast, so you each have one minute. <laughs> one minute. First, I'd like to assure the audience that there's no panic. Induced by an almost Buddhist sense of calm. Uh, secondly, that we all recognize the, the great successes that our international system has, has delivered over, over the past years. And I say that genuinely. I, you know, I, I don't think that we're dealing with failed systems. I think we're dealing with, with, with huge problems. Now, uh, generally, a, a governance system is defined by, by its ability to take measures at the scale at a scale commensurate with the problems that it's trying to address, and that those measures keep pace with the pace of the problem's development. And by both of those measures, I think it's clear that our governance systems in the international level uh, are not up to the task. 
So the question is, shall we redouble our efforts and buckle down and do another uh, few months of negotiations on the Doha round, or should we start casting about for alternatives? And I, I think that we've reached the point where there's a great deal of need for creativity, but also a, a lot of scope for innovative actions. And I think that we are at the point where we, sh we can explore them. I think that if we explore them and that they are successful, they will not undermine uh, the WTO or the UNFCCC. I think they will enrich it. Thank you. So two, point, two quick, uh, very quick points. Uh, one is on, the, on this comprehensive uh, uh, multilateral climate treaty. Uh, so beyond the effectiveness of, of it, uh, one of the, of the obvious points that, that uh, comes out of this discussion and, and reflection on these issues is that the design of that architecture would also have to be very carefully done so that we, in uh, doing it, uh, give a response to, to the kind of questions that have been asked. So I'm saying that because I think that the, the burden to come up with options on, for instance, how is compliance going to be uh, ensured in that sort of, of, uh, of arrangement? Is it going to be through trade penalties and sanctions, for instance, and, or in which way and what is the relationship that then should be defined between that kind of a comprehensive treaty and the trade system is is also a very complex issue that we haven't heard about, but still we keep hearing that that's the first best option. So, so again, I, I think that there's a, there's a need to, to to come up with those options. That the second point I wanted to make is again back to plurilaterals. Plurilaterals are um, uh, part of the DNA of this house, so it's not something that it's that, that is that strange. Um, here we have a number of um, of agreements, and you can use and have had in the past incredibly successful plurilaterals that have led uh, to multilateral solutions or otherwise to effective solutions. And, uh, and you have different models. And so uh, some of them are, for instance, the ITA, the, Inter the Information Technologies Agreement, or the GP type of model, the, the, the Government Procurement Agreement, uh, with their different char characteristics and, and so on. And, and uh, around those models, you can build, um, uh, again, those plurilaterals that we're talking about. But there are also cases of plurilaterals outside, including to deal with the specific trade and environmental issues uh, that have then moved up to become uh, uh, multilateral uh, kind of treaties. And, uh, and they're consistent with the WTO. They have been started outside of the WTO and the trade system. And perhaps the most effective one is the Montreal Protocol, which is in, in, in effect a trade agreement or the CITES agreement. Um, but there are many other examples, including um, also just on trade. So, so I think, uh, again, the mandates are there, both in the existing committees, in the Doha round, and if not, in the evolutionary nature that, and, the, and the mandate to guide this evolution that is given to the ministerial conference. So there is a space to do these things here. Just to answer that question um, very crudely, um, the, the idea that um, local content requirements and uh, transfer of technology will be intimately linked is probably wishful thinking. That probably doesn't answer the question. But um, now, now to sum up, <laughs> I, want to, I want to commend IISD for this initiative. I think it's been good. I mean, I haven't seen all of it, but what I've seen I think has been interesting and informative. I don't think uh, it's been particularly conclusive, but I take away from this that had it been so, it would have been probably through the exercise of demagoguery of some sort or another. <laughs> so I think with that, I'd like to thank everybody for coming, and I believe there's... Cocktails in the conference. Cocktails in the where? In the conference. Ah, oh, you've got to go across the conference centre if you want a free drink. Okay, well, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.